It's been a couple of years now uh, since I told you that the very first woodworking project that I ever did, the very first time that I ever built something that would then launch me into a hobby that I don't see myself ever stopping anytime soon, no matter how expensive it is and how many times my wife pleased ask me to not buy any more tools. I told you the first woodworking project I ever had was our kitchen table. Uh, but this week I, I some, saw something and something sparked a memory within my own mind that reminded me that that's not entirely true. Now hold on, before you get all upset and you think that, that I lied to you, please understand a couple of years ago when I told you that my table was the first woodworking project I ever did, I genuinely thought that was the case because in reality the first woodworking project I ever made was so terrible and so dumb and had so many mistakes to it that my brain refused to acknowledge its existence. Fun stuff, right? Let me tell you what is happening. Uh, it was going into one of my later years at Johnson. I don't remember if it was my last year or not, but it was, it was pretty close to it. And, and we're getting ready for college. And Johnson would always provide you in your dorm room, would provide you with a bed, a dresser, and a small bookshelf. And again, I don't remember where I was in my college experience at this point in time, but I knew that at this point I had amassed so many books and so many resources, and if I'm being honest with you, so many movies, that that little bookshelf was not going to be able to hold all of them. And so I had this desire to build something that was different. I recognized that there was a need for something, that I needed to have another bookshelf. I needed to be able to have this sort of thing to be able to hold on to all these different things. It wouldn't be able to, to have my, my collection of different things. So I needed this second bookshelf that, wouldn't, that would just be able to get the books and movies and stuff that my other provided bookshelf would not be able to. A need had been established for me. But it wasn't like the second bookshelf was just going to magically appear. In order for the second bookshelf to take place, I had to have a desire and a will to see that bookshelf built. Now, at this particular point in time in my life, in my early 20s, this is often where the idea would come to die, right? I was very lazy in my college years. I, well, I'm still kind of lazy now, but, but at 38 years old almost, I, I, I don't understand how I functioned my entire life up to that point in time by just allowing myself to have these great ideas and then let them go. Because the desire to do things was just not there for me at that point in time. And yet, for some reason, the need for this bookshelf was so great for me that I felt like if I didn't have this secondary bookshelf, there was going to be a day where I was going to need a certain book that was not on the bookshelf, and I was going to need it to be able to finish this project or the sermon or whatever it was that we were doing in school at that point in time, and I wouldn't be able to find it because it wasn't on a bookshelf that was easily accessible, and I was going to fail that assignment, which was going to lead me failing that class, which was going to lead me failing my other classes because I was in so much distress, and I was going to flunk out of Johnson so severely that they would bar me from ever being able to say the words Johnson Bible College. It's amazing how extreme our minds are when we're in our youth, right? So for whatever reason, that need was so great that the will and the desire to have a second bookshelf was finally there. The need is great, but if you don't have the will or the desire, it doesn't really matter. And so this would lead me to what is kind of the last part of any project that you're going to undergo. I, since, since that table, since this bookshelf, I have made hundreds of different things. And I can tell you that if you're going to make a project, you need three different things beforehand. You need the need for it. If, you're not going to, if you don't have a need, then what's the point? You need to have the will and the desire to make it. And then you need the third thing. You need to have a plan. And this is where early 20s, making his first very, very first woodworking project, Brandon, failed miserably. I did not plan. Right? If you're going to start to make something, you need to come up with a plan of how you're going to approach it. If you're going to make something out of wood, you want to come up with your cut list. If you're, if you're going to make something out of anything else, you need to have the resources gathered. You need to have an idea of what it's going to be. I recommend sometimes even just drawing out, no matter how good you are at art, drawing out an idea of what you want it to look like when it's done. That's going to be incredibly helpful as you make this project, because if you're not going to plan, the project's not going to be great. And again, early 20s Brandon, who had a need and a desire for a new bookshelf, did not come up with a plan. 
I went out to our garage. We had some, some different wood that was all in there. I don't remember what it was for initially. I don't think it matters. But I picked out a couple of pieces, and I knew that the sides had to match, so I picked out two pieces that were pretty close to the same size. I didn't have a saw, so I couldn't cut them. And if I did have a saw at that particular point in time, I'd be sincerely worried I would cut off my thumb. And then how would I hitchhike? You know, I've never hitchhiked before, but that was the thought I had. So I just grabbed two pieces of wood that were pretty close to the same size for the sides. And then I gathered some other wood for the support and the, and the shelf itself that were pretty close to the same size. I didn't use any wood glue. I didn't use any screws. I just grabbed some uh, hammer and some nails that we had lying around, and I nailed it together. And when I finished this bookshelf, let me tell you about this, this thing was terrible. It was awful. It, it rocked whenever it sat on level ground. Um, it was made up of different breeds of wood that clashed to completely with each other. Um, they, it did not match at all. It looked exactly like a, a guy who has no idea what he's doing built it. And so I decided that since it looked this terrible, that I was going to do the one thing that everybody does when they think that something that's made out of wood looks terrible. I painted it. It's going to fix everything, right? No, I just made it look worse. <laughs> but you know what? It was functional. It was useful, I suppose. I ended up taking it to school with me. All of my friends made fun of me all year for it. I deserved that. But I don't know what happened to it since then. It was so awful that after that school year, I just, I think I left it there or maybe threw it in the dumpster or maybe gave it to a freshman because freshmen are idiots. <laughs> And they just took it from me anyway. But, but that's, the, that's the story of my very first woodworking project. I, I needed to prepare for that. I needed to prepare for that project to be, to be better. Um, I might have kept it had the planning actually taken place. It can always be somewhat intimidating, though, whenever you begin a project. Every time I've started on a project since then, regardless of the size and the scope of it, there is still a moment of intimidation for it. Uh, things are... are, are seem like you're not, if you don't know how you're going to do this, it, it can be really intimidating to do this. If you don't know how to get started with it, that can be really frustrating even. There's a fear that you might mess up the entire thing and then you've wasted time and resources. Uh, and if there's one, two things I hate wasting, it's time and money. And so if, if you're going to start a project, you need to have this idea. And, and let's be honest, sky, size and scope does kind of matter. The bigger a project is, the scarier it can be. The bigger that a project is going to be, or at least the more functional that a project is supposed to be, it can be intimidating. No matter what the project is, it can be kind of a scary prospect to get started on a project. And that's especially true whenever we're talking about a rebuild or a reconstruction. When you're trying to replace something that was important and was useful and even was meaningful for all kinds of other people, the idea of getting started on that can paralyze you with fear. It can be so difficult to know how to get started. It can be troubling to know what it was beforehand. There can even be a moment of despair in realizing that a reconstruction is necessary, either because of negligence or abuse. You can be worried that I don't know how to build this the way that it was. I don't know what techniques were used. They don't make the kind of paint or wood stain anymore that was used here. So I don't know how I'm going to approach that sort of thing. But that's why whenever you are thinking about any kind of reconstruction, you need to make sure that there is a need for it, that you have the desire to see this through even when it gets hard, and more importantly, that you prepare for it, that you are ready for it, that you approach it in every possible way. Preparation can be time-consuming, but it is almost always worth doing in any sort of a reconstruction. And for the Israelites in our text today, they are approaching a reconstruction. They are approaching not just any sort of a reconstruction, they're approaching one of the most important reconstructions that they're ever going to face. We're going to find ourselves through the course of this series in a couple of books that maybe you've never turned to in your Bibles. It's entirely possible. Uh, we're going to be in Ezra and Haggai. Those are going to be the two books throughout the course of this series. We might venture a little bit into Nehemiah and a little bit into Zechariah too because they all kind of take place around the same time period. Uh, but for today, at least, we're just going to be in the book of Ezra. We're going to be in Ezra chapters 1 through 3. And so I want to ask you to turn your Bibles there. This may take you a moment. Again, you may not be overly familiar with where Ezra is, and that's okay. 
because we frankly have a lot of background information to get to. I'm going to be real with you. I'm going to hit you with a lot of history right now. And this may get frustrating for you. This may get hopefully not boring for you. But this is going to be a little difficult for us to navigate. But I think it's going to be worth it in the long run. See, for a long time, the Israelites lived in the promised land. It was the land that God had promised them all the way back from Abraham, that he led them to through Moses, that he conquered through Joshua. Over the course of their time in this promised land, they had some incredible times. They, they lived under the reigns of King David and King Solomon, two of the wisest kings and best kings that any nation had ever seen before or since. Solomon himself had led the nation of Israel into a time of prosperity that was unheard of. I recently heard this not too long ago through the study that we're doing in our Sunday school class. Solomon himself made $2 million a day. He was worth $2 trillion. By comparison, that makes Bezos look like a pauper. <laughs> right? Solomon led the nation of Israel into a level of prosperity that it had never seen before. But if you think back to last year when we talked about Solomon, the reason why we don't consider Solomon to be the best king in all of Israel, the reason why we don't consider him as great as his father was the way that things ended for him. Over the course of time, Solomon's heart began to be turned away from God and led into idol worship. And unfortunately, after the reign of Solomon, that idol worship would continue and persist. And it would get a lot worse. There would be times of upheaval. Actually, the nation of Israel would be split into two different nations, Israel and Judah. The, both of them would still deal with the same issues of idol worship and, and, and even heresy. There would be brief periods of time of reform and revival and even reconnection with God, but it was always short-lived. It was always short-lived, and over time, the hearts of the people would grow hard. And understand that the promise of God had always been the same as what we see in Ezekiel 36, verse 28. The same promise is listed in other places in Scripture, but Ezekiel, I think, sums it up nicely. He says, you will live in the land that I gave your ancestors. You will be my people, and I will be your God. But now they're not behaving like they belong to God. They have turned away and they have begun worshiping idols. And I don't know if you remember this or not, but, but the whole idea of don't worship idols, that made the Big Ten. God is not really thrilled with that sort of behavior. He did everything that he could. He, he sent people to kind of talk to them and, and try to bring them back and do everything that he could to, to before it led to some sort of big consequence. He would keep sending messengers to warn them that if they don't repent, if they don't turn away from this, it's going to go down. But eventually it led to 2 Chronicles 36, 15 and 16. It says this, But the Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word against them by the hand of his messengers, sending them time and time again. For he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place, but they kept ridiculing God's messengers despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the Lord's wrath was so stirred up against his people that, and we cannot miss these words, these have got to haunt us, there was no remedy. They had been warned over and over again by God and if you don't turn your hearts back to me, if you don't get away from this idol worship of these fake and phony gods, you're going to suffer some consequences. Right? As parents, we know what this is like, right? We, we warn our children all the time, hey, don't do that. If you keep doing that, there's going to be consequences. Finally, we have to raise our voices a little bit, and our kids said, I don't know why you're yelling at me, and it's because you weren't listening to me the first 13 times, Adrian. But eventually there's going to have to be consequences. And, and no matter how many messengers God sent to the Israelites, no matter how many times he told them, please turn this around, please stop doing this, it reached the point that there was no remedy. 
Do you understand how bad it has to get before God says there's no remedy? Whew. God had enough. And if they weren't going to be his people, then they weren't going to get to live in this land. Right? That's the promise that he said in Ezekiel. He said, you'll live in the land that I gave your ancestors. You'll be my people. I'll be your God. But they're not being his people. So as a consequence, they don't get to live in the land. The Chaldeans attacked them. They plundered Jerusalem. They hauled off all the treasures that they could find, including those within the temple of God himself. And they hauled it back to Babylon. And then as 2 Corinthians 36 verses 19 and 20 says, Then the Chaldeans burned God's temple. They tore down Jerusalem's wall. They burned all its palaces and destroyed all its valuable articles. He deported those who escaped from the sword to Babylon. And they became servants to him and his sons until the rise of the Persian kingdom. Jerusalem is gone. Understand, again, how significant this is. Just a couple of generations ago, Jerusalem was the city. It was the one that everybody wanted to flock to. They wanted to come and learn from Solomon. They wanted to come and, and find out about it. It was the most prosperous city on God's green earth at that time. And just a couple of generations away, and it's ruined. The temple of God that Solomon invested so much time and effort and energy and money and resources into. The place where all of Israel would come to worship is now ashes. And the people that were left, those who didn't die in battle, were hauled away to a foreign land and forced to live there as servants. None of that is good. Right? Like we can all agree the idea of, of your home being burned and you being forced into slavery, that's, that's not exactly a great situation, right? Right? Yes? No? Some of you think that maybe sounds like an, a vacation? I would ask you to see a therapist. None of that is good. But here's the thing. I, I don't think... Mm, I don't think it's the worst thing that could have happened to them. Okay, I get it. I see it. I see it. You got those confused looks on... What are you talking about, Brandon? Their home's destroyed. The temple's burned down. They're forced to live in a foreign land. I don't think that's the worst thing to ever happen to them. I say that because as they are in Babylon and as they're, they're forced away from the promised land of God, they have some time to reflect. The Israelites have some time to realize the depths of their depravity, the, the, the depths at which they let things get to the point that they've now lost their home. And they understand that all of this started when they started worshiping other idols, when they turned their hearts away from God. And something begins to happen. There's a new spiritual awakening that takes place in this foreign land. We see, we see some signs and evidence of it. So there was actually a couple of psalms that we have recorded in Scripture that were written during this Babylonian captivity. One of them is Psalm 137. And in verse 1 it reads, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. They're in Babylon and they are in mourning. They are weeping because what they've done has really begun to hit home. They've, it's cost them their own home. And they recognize that because we've done this, we've strayed so far away from God, now we're forced here. It goes on in verse 4 of that same psalm. And it says, how can we sing the Lord's song on a foreign soil? They have recognized that we have let things go so far that now their hearts are beginning to turn back to God. And we begin to see signs and evidence of that through some of the youth of Israel that's listed during that Babylonian exile. Names that we've come to know pretty well. Folks like Daniel. 
like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Guys who were so on fire for God that, that even though they were brought to, to live in these palaces and, and told to eat the king's food, they did not want to defile their God. They did not want to turn their hearts away from them. And time after time throughout their lives, that spiritual awakening is still prevalent within them. That relationship, that love, that compassion for their God, the God of Israel, even though they're not in Israel, is still so great that they take a stand for it over and over again, even at the cost of their very lives. They will not turn their hearts away from God like generations before them had done. A new spiritual revival and awakening is taking place. This is key because while they're in the midst of what appears to be the worst situation they could ever possibly get into, the seeds of hope are beginning to bloom and things are starting to change in the hearts of the Israelites. And so when the time comes, when the time finally comes for them to be allowed to return home, there's already that groundwork for that spiritual renewal. The reconstruction of their relationship with God has already been well under place. This is stirred on even further by King Cyrus of the Persians. Because after the Babylonians fell, you can read Daniel 5 for more information on that. But when the nation of Babylon itself fell, the Medes and the Persians rose up. And they began to take possession over all the Babylonians had, including everything that belonged to Israel. And King Cyrus, this very wise king, made a decision and he wasn't just going to let the Isra some of the Israelites go home for the first time in 70 years. He wasn't just going to let them return back to Jerusalem, but he even gave them permission to do something incredible. He issues this decree in our text today, Ezra chapter 1. And in verses 2 and 4, it says this. It says, this is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of the heavens, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you, may God be with him, and may he go to Jerusalem in Judah and build the house of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. Let every survivor, whether, wherever he resides, be assisted by the men of that region with silver, gold, goods, and livestock, along with a freewill offering for the house of God in Jerusalem. Understand, they're not just allowed to go home. They're allowed to go home with the express purpose of rebuilding the temple. That's huge for a nation that has been undergoing a spiritual awakening for 70 years to finally be told, not only can you go home, I want you to go home and I want you to go build that temple again. To go have your house of worship. To go have the place where you and your family and your people can go and gather and sing praises to your God. How is this not good news for a people who for 70 years have lived in captivity? But remember what they're going home to. Again, the entire city is gone. It's destroyed. There's some rubble and ruins to, to indicate that there was a city here at one point in time. The walls of that city, the markers of their defense is destroyed. And remember what happened to the temple? It was burned to ash. There has to be some despair. We learn in a later chapter, something we're going to be talking about next week. We learn that there were some who came back from Jerusalem who remembered what the temple of God looked like. Who remember what it had been. And so as they're coming back to Jerusalem and recognizing that this is not what it used to be, there has to be a sense of despair. How are we ever going to get it back to its former glory? How are we ever going to be able to see this temple of God raised again? How are we going to have this particular moment? But understand, the time for despair, that's over now. Because it's time for us to get to work. This new spiritual awakening, this decree and permission from King Cyrus, the need for a temple, a place of worship has been established. 
right? For, for 70 years now, they have lived with this notion of, I've got to turn myself back to God. We've got to repent. We've got to get back right with him. We need to reestablish that connection with him. And when you get back to your home, what do you need? You need a place to go and worship that God. A place to go and sing praises to him as a people, to come together as one and celebrate him. So while they may have despaired over the loss of what was, the need for it to be back far outweighs that despair. The pain of what they felt for what it used to be is outweighed by the need for a temple to be rebuilt. So the need has been established. What's next? There has to be a desire and a will to do that. And not only is that will present in these people, not only is the desire to see the temple of God already there, it is being elevated in a supernatural way. I say that because of Ezra chapter 1 verse 5. It says this, So the family heads of Judah and Benjamin, along with the priests and Levites, everyone whose spirit God had roused. Not everyone whose spirit is roused for God, but everyone whose spirit God has roused, prepared to go up and rebuild the Lord's house in Jerusalem. The people have seen the need, and now God himself is, is taking that desire to see the temple back, and he is elevating it. He is stirring that up. I already get pretty hyped up about certain things, especially if I'm working on a new project and I, I'm excited to see what it's going to be like when it's done. I can't imagine having a supernatural being elevate that. You guys have seen me. You know me well enough to know. I get pretty excited about some stuff. Can you imagine if God was adding to that? I'd be unbearable, right? I mean, let's be real. <laughs> None of you would want to talk to me, and that's fine. But these guys are so amped up to get this done. The desire is so there. They've seen the need, and God is himself is actually stirring their hearts. But here's the thing. I don't think God is stirring their hearts because God himself feels like he needs to have a temple. Right? This is God we're talking about. This is the infinite. This is the all-powerful. This is the almighty. He doesn't need a temple for himself. If he really needed a temple for himself, he'd do what he did throughout all of creation. He'd speak it into existence. It would be there, and everybody would just go, oh my goodness. He doesn't need this temple for him. God is stirring their hearts. And building this back up because he is excited about the spiritual reawakening. He is excited in their desire to reestablish their relationship with him. And he recognizes what the temple represents. It is the house of worship. It is the house where they know that that is where God resides. That is where we can come to go for God. We as people, we have always kind of needed those physical things that we can look to. Physical representations of things that are spiritual. And so God recognizes that, that these people, they want to see, they want to see their relationship with him restored so much that they need this temple. And so God stirs it within themselves to make sure that that desire is there. So we have a need. Now we have a desire, a supernatural desire even. What's next? We got a plan. We need to prepare. We need to get things ready. We need to get our resources gathered together. And, and King Cyrus himself actually gives them a, a good hand on building up those resources in, in verses 9 through 11 of chapter 1. It says, there, this was the inventory. 30 gold basins, 1,000 silver basins, 29 silver knives, 30 gold bowls, 410 various silver bowls. I love that it says various silver boards, bowls there. Like all the other ones are like, this is all just bowls. And this one's, these are various ones. Yeah. They don't match, but it's fine. That's just me. Sorry. And a thousand other articles. The gold and silver articles totaled 5,400. Sheshbazar brought all of, the, uh, all of them when the exiles went up from Babylon to Jerusalem. This is a good start. King Cyrus is giving them back some of the articles that were useful in the temple. He's giving them back things that were used as part of their worship when the old temple was still there. He's giving them some of the resources that they're going to need when the temple is built, but they still need to get that temple together. And if you know anything about any sort of a building project, you know it's going to take some cash, right? So they get some more resources in chapter 2, verses 68 and 69. It says, after they arrived at the Lord's house in Jerusalem, some of the family heads 
gave free will offerings for the house of God in order to have it rebuilt on its original site. Based on what they could give, they gave 61,000 gold coins, 6,250 pounds of silver, and 100 priestly garments for the treasury for this project. This is all well and good. Like, please don't misunderstand. Like, this stuff is, this is a lot of stuff. I know I just threw some facts and figures, and some of you are getting a little droopy-eyed now. Stay with me, please. This is all well and good, but while they have a great start on the resources that are needed, they still need to plan that reconstruction. They still need to figure out how they're going to build this temple, and that's going to take some time. They can't just wait to worship God, though. Right? Planning for a reconstruction or planning for any construction, really, that takes some time. And for something that's as important as the temple of God itself, you want to make sure that you take plenty of time to prepare. But what do you do in the meantime? If you're doing any sort of a reconstruction or a rebuild, you have to have something that's functional. If you ever redid your kitchen or something like that, you probably know this already. You need to have something to be able to cook some food on, right? You can't just go to McDonald's every single night. That's a terrible plan for your long-term cardiovascular health. Right? So you have to have something that's functional, at least. It doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be great. It just needs to work. That's it. And so for these folks, while they're waiting for the temple to be rebuilt, on its original site, they decide to build something that's useful for now. We see this in chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. It says, they set up an altar on its foundation, and they offered burnt offerings for the morning and the evening on it, that the Lord... E er, to the Lord, even though they feared the surrounding peoples. They celebrated the festival of shelters as prescribed and offered burnt offerings each day based on the number specified by the ordinance for each festival day. After that, they offered the regular burnt offering and the offerings for the beginning of each month and for all the Lord's appointed holy occasions as well as the free will offerings brought to the Lord. On the surface... On the surface, this doesn't seem like a lot, right? They built an altar. Throughout the entire Old Testament, we see everybody building an altar. Jacob built a bunch of altars. Abraham built a few altars. Moses built some altars along the way. This doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal. But when we consider everything... When we take the whole scope, the reason why we spent so much time talking about what happened before this, when we think about 70 years in captivity, the very first time that these people gather to worship, to celebrate the festival of shelters in Jerusalem on the site of the temple itself, how significant was that worship service? The temple's not built yet. The reconstruction is just getting started. But they're gathering together and they are worshiping. Not just for what God has done in bringing them out of their captivity. You've got to imagine that's a huge part of it. But they're also worshiping, for God, worshiping God for what's going to happen. They're excited. There's an anticipation about what's going to take place. They are on the site of where their reconstruction is going to be taking place. And they can't wait. Imagine being a part of that worship service that recognizes there's been a need for a reconstruction, that a desire has been built up within them, that even though they're still in the planning and the preparation of it, we can't stop worshiping because we're so excited for what God has in store for us. We recognize that the way things were, they didn't work. It didn't work for us in the long run. It, it just fell apart. But now we're excited because there's something new. The time for despair, the time for mourning over what we had lost, that's over. It's time to get hyped and get excited about what's coming next. It's not hard for us to see that the church of today, particularly here in the United States, is due for a spiritual awakening. It's not hard for us to look around the landscape around us and see that we need to have a spiritual reconstruction within the heart of the church, 
It's not hard for us to see how far we have drifted away from God. That the church is not functioned in the way that he had originally planned. The evidence is around us all the time. So it is somewhat natural, and I would even use the word understandable, to hear the sounds of despair coming from Christians, mourning the loss of what was. But can I be honest with you? Can I be real transparent with you today? I am so tired of despair. I am so tired of whining about what it used to be. I'm so tired of asking why can't it be like that again. There's a need for reconstruction. There's a need for a spiritual awakening to take place here in the church. I'm not talking about a physical reconstruction. I'm not advising that we tear this building down and build a new one. Though that could be kind of fun too. We need to have a spiritual awakening happening within the church. The church has not functioned in the way that it was intended to. So let's work on rebuilding instead of sitting in our despair about it. But even though the Israelites despaired at the loss at what was, there were things that pointed towards hope of what was to come, even while they were in captivity. Right? We talked about that. There were several young people who had, who had stepped up and would loudly and proudly proclaim who they were, that they were not going to turn against God, even to the face of the kings of Babylon themselves. And I believe that I am beginning to see the signs of hope within our own culture, in our own context. I can't tell you how many times lately, it, I don't know what it is, but lately it seems like a lot, of, a lot of professional athletes or athletes in general who are on a national stage, right? We, we're used to the post-game interviews with those athletes. They go, all glorious to God. Man, my team played so great. But that's not what I'm seeing anymore. I'm seeing these young athletes who are standing up there and they're saying, all glory goes to God. I watched a young quarterback this year after his team got eliminated from the playoffs, after he suffered the worst loss of his very young NFL career so far, he got up on the podium and the first words that came out of his mouth is, Christ is still on his throne. We're all good. I saw an interview just the other day with another quarter, a different quarterback in the NFL, and the, the reporter asked him about a bracelet that he was wearing. What does that mean? And all that stuff. He says, oh, all glory goes to Christ. That's what it's all about. That's all I exist for. They're using this national platform and the influence that is just starting to grow amongst them to loudly and proudly proclaim the name of Jesus. And we might look at that and we might feel like kind of cynical about that, like, well, oh, that's nice and stuff, I guess. But understand that there's a whole crop of young people who are starting to find these sports and f starting to find these athletes. Think about the power of that influence that they're going to have. Lately as well, I've been seeing a lot more actors and actresses, people in Hollywood, who are turning to Jesus. There's an actor right now who is growing in his popularity, who may or may not be the next Batman. We're waiting to find out. I'm waiting to find out. I need to know who the next Batman's going to be. And I just read an article where he talks about how he fell in love with Jesus. And about how at 36 he wanted to end his life that somebody came along at the right time and pointed him towards Jesus. And ever since then, it has awakened a spiritual awakening within himself that he is now loudly proclaiming in his own platform, which is growing. These are signs and seeds of hope that are taking place. And yeah, let's be real. Sometimes these guys aren't going to be the best example, but sometimes neither am I. Sometimes neither are you. But I believe that this points to signs and seeds of hope for the spiritual awakening that is going to take place. And so I get frustrated when I hear Christians sit and moan about the way it used to be. I get frustrated when I hear of all these, these just, I love you guys, I do. I get tired of whiny Christians. <laughs> what does whining accomplish? Nothing. <laughs> 
We would be so much better used if instead we use that energy that we waste in whining about the way things were, if we use that same energy to start that reconstruction. Right? We see the need for it. Can I tell you where I think we fall short, though? What's the second part of a reconstruction? It's the will. It's the desire. To say that even though this job is big, I'm going to see this through. Even though I'm a little intimidated by it, I'm going to make sure this job gets done. Folks, I think that's where so many of us as Christians, we fail. Because it is intimidating, right? We can acknowledge that. That's okay. It's intimidating to think about the idea of a reconstruction of a church that, that at one point in time was on fire. It's a scary prospect to consider. And so maybe, just maybe, we need supernatural intervention there. So maybe for today, as we understand that there is a need for a spiritual reconstruction in the church of Jesus Christ, not just at Macedonia, but all throughout the world, maybe instead of praying, God, can you make it what it used to be? Maybe instead our prayer today needs to be, God, will you stir my heart? Will you stir my heart in the same way that you did those Israelites to where that desire to see your church reconstructed to not only be what it used to be, but be even better than what it used to be? Because I'm going to tell you this. I was going to save this for a later sermon, but I don't care. It's fine. After Ezra... At no point in time does the nation of Israel ever struggle with idolatry again. It had been a problem that had persisted for generations among them, but after they come back from Babylonian captivity, they never have that problem again. They got other problems, to be sure, right? I mean, the Pharisees were Israelites. But idolatry was never an issue again. They never turned their hearts to other gods again. And so if we have that supernatural desire within ourselves to see the reconstruction of the church of Jesus Christ in the United States or in the world as a whole, that maybe, just maybe, we can avoid the same problems and pitfalls that led us to this point in the first place. So I'm begging you. I'm pleading with you. If it wouldn't hurt my knees, I might just get down on them and ask you for this. Make your prayer today that God would stir within you a desire to see a spiritual reconstruction in his church. And then let's get busy planning it. Let's get busy getting ready for it. There's work to do. Let's prepare for it. The author of Hebrews would write in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 22 and 23, and we're going to close with it today. He said, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful.